Yeah. Uh, so before the break, uh, we looked at Second Corinthians chapter seven verses nine to ten, uh, which talk about godly sorrow. Now we can understand repentance better. Uh, this whole concept of repentance, we are able to understand it better when we understand the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Um, because people who are displaying worldly sorrow are not actually repentant. Okay, so um, uh, we are able to better understand uh, repentance once we understand the actual difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. We'll begin by looking at an example of worldly sorrow, someone who ex who expressed worldly sorrow rather than godly sorrow. Uh, so if we could have someone read out for us, 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, verses 27 to 31. 1 Samuel 15, 27 to 31, please. Well, I hope people have come back from the break and rejoined at least a few. Uh, if we have at least one listener who is actually there in the class, uh, could you please, no, please read out 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 27 to 31. You know, there's just one student who has joined the class. Could you please know, read out 1 Samuel 15, 27 to 31? 1 Samuel 15, 27 to 31, Pastor? Yes. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to the neighbor of yours who is better than you and also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent for he is not a man that he should relent then he said I have sinned yet honor me now please before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me, that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. OK, Amen. so here we have Saul, who admits that he has sinned. OK, so he he does not try to make up any more excuses. You know, he, uh, he realizes that what he has done is sinful. So we have Saul admitting that he has committed a sin. But when he desperately reaches out to Samuel and catches hold of his garment, it's not out of a desperation that he is losing Yahweh uh, or, you know, or that he's going to be deprived of Yahweh's presence. Um, you know, Brother Collins, you know, if you could just mute yourself um, because it's kind of creating static at my end. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, so, um, when he reaches out desperately and catches hold of the robe, it's not because you know he's 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 terrified that he's going to be losing Yahweh or losing his approval. He catches hold because he's he wants to say, yes, it's true that I have sinned, but you know the, all the people are watching, and I'm going to lose face in front of them if you know if you just walk away, then people will look down on me. So you know, come back along with me. And then, you know, we will go and worship the Lord. So this man is not worshipping the Lord to worship the Lord. He is going and worshipping the Lord so that, you know, to maintain the ceremonies, to maintain his status, you know, to kind of continue showing people that he is still the king and he's doing a cover-up job. So there is a lot of sorrow over here, but the sorrow is over the loss of face. You know, which is going to happen now. It's it's sorrow over losing the kingdom. It is sorrow over um, you know being deprived of God's approval. Where because God, you know, he had um, God's approval up to now, things were going really well for him. But now God is no longer going to be on his side, backing him up, 
so in that sense you know this sorrow about that so it if you look at worldly sorrow it's all about me 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 i am losing out on this oh i am going to be deprived of this oh i think i am going to get punished by god now oh my goodness how terrible um it's all me 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 worldly sorrow is me feeling really sorry for myself and i think worldly sorrow is all about uh, feeling really bad that i got caught oh i wish i had not got caught you know i wish my sin had not been exposed so worldly sorrow it's it's all about you know feeling really bad that this person that i am worshiping me whom i have been worshiping is now going to get a you know a, a real blow so worldly sorrow is all about me on the other hand we look at, at an example of godly sorrow and how you know david responds when he is corrected by a different prophet so saul gets uh, corrected by samuel david on the other hand gets corrected by nathan and uh, after nathan has you know corrected david this is david's response uh, which we see recorded in psalm 51 and if we could if someone could read out psalm 51 verses 10 to 12 psalm 51 10 to 12 uh maybe the other students have not yet joined in brother collins if you can read again fifty one yes, go ahead fifty one ten ten to fifty one any the verse pastor oh yeah yeah fifty one ten to twelve please thank you create create in me a a clean heart oh god and renew the steadfast spirit within me do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your holy spirit from me restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit then amen. i will teach okay amen i know yeah, no that, that that should be enough uh, yeah so thank you uh, so here uh, david is saying you know do not cast me from your presence or take your holy spirit from me Samuel, see, for and... him yeah if you yes it's muted yeah thank you um so um so here uh we see that uh, uh you know david is is saying for him the main concern is that you know he'll in some way lose out on god's presence he has always loved the lord from a young age he's always you know put god first in his life and now after this terrible sin that he has done he is so worried that he will lose god and so he says do not cast me from your presence or take your holy spirit from me you know uh, he says you know instead why don't you work on me why don't you clean me up you know so he says create in me a pure heart oh god you renew a steadfast spirit because my spirit you know my human spirit is always wandering away from you but lord if you could make it steadfast so that it really loves you so that it really honors you and um, and you know he says restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit because on my own i am not able to follow your laws but if you will give me a willing spirit you know that will sustain me that will help me to continue in your presence so here um godly sorrow is feeling ashamed of what you have done to the lord you have betrayed his trust you have dishonored him you know and he that's why he says in the earlier verse you know he says against you and you alone have i sinned o lord so he 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 is ashamed that he dishonored god he is deeply regretful that uh, you know he brought a, um, uh, that he brought a bad name you know to to yahweh being the king he behaved in this way and so he kind of brought a bad name to yahweh in front of all the nations he is so deeply ashamed of what he has done so here the sorrow is all god focused and he is saying you clean me up lord you change me because then i will be able to honor you you put a steadfast spirit within me and you grant me a willing spirit he says you know so it's all god focused so if my repentance is all about you know me having lost certain privileges because i got caught in sin and now i will have to you know um um 
and now I'll have to straighten out my act and and I'm feeling really bad that you know now I have to give up so many things just to honor God and I'm feeling really miserable that is worldly sorrow it's all me focused on the other hand godly sorrow is acknowledgement that Lord what I have done is sin in your eyes you have trusted me all along you have been so loving and compassionate and how have I repaid you I have done this horrible thing so you know you you're ashamed and you're hurt you're wounded that you did something so miserable to someone so beautiful you know and you think how how could I do something so wretched to someone who has shown me nothing but love and compassion and you know you're you're so regretful for that and so you cry out and say Lord you please change me I'm so rotten I can never change on my own but I really long to honor you I really long to be different so you oh Lord help me and you and you 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 come to a point where you say Lord whatever I need to give up to straighten myself out Lord I'm willing to give up that whatever needs to be cut off Lord I'm willing to cut it off cut it out of my life you know that would be um true repentance so if a person has got godly sorrow in their heart that genuinely leads to uh, true repentance on the other hand if all we are feeling is worldly sorrow then there's no actual repentance involved over there okay so and the second thing that we need to you know uh, understand an equally important teaching about godly sorrow and worldly sorrow um is uh, regarding our response you know when we realize that what we have done is sinful and we feel a deep conviction regarding the sinful thing that we have done how do we respond to that deep conviction um, that is very very important as well um, so we will look at you know uh, Judas um, you know and the worldly sorrow which he expressed uh, Matthew chapter 27 verses 3 to 5 so if someone could read out for us Matthew 27 3 to 5 Matthew chapter 27 verse 3 to 5 then Judas his betrayer seeing that he had been condemned was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying I have sinned by betraying innocent blood and they said what is that to us you see to it then he drew down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself but the chief priest took yeah, the silver that, pieces and that said, should be all right that should be enough yeah yeah so here we see that um, Judas is genuinely really sorry for what he has done. Uh, when he saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver. This whole thing that he you know, indulged in was for the sake of that 30 pieces. He was greedy for, that, for those 30 pieces. Now he is so deeply regretful he doesn't even care about those 30 pieces so he goes back and he gives it back to those people and he says i don't want this anymore what i have done is really horrible really sinful you know if he could have changed it he would have changed it he is genuinely deeply remorseful deeply regretful for what he has done and so he tries to return the money you know he no longer has a desire for it he's no longer greedy for it um, uh, he's cured of his uh, lust for wealth you know um, and he says I have sinned for I have betrayed innocent blood and then they say that's your responsibility so we don't want the money you know they say but he doesn't want the money he doesn't want to take it back so he actually just throws it on the floor and he leaves but one thing about him is that he has given up all hope this only dark despair and that causes him to go and hang himself so that is worldly sorrow where you have completely lost hope in God where you think it's over it's finished now there is no redemption for me there is no hope for me and that is actually a very very sad thing it's a huge lie of the evil one and you know um judas falls prey to that lie he he believes what satan is you know saying to him in his heart that now he's beyond all hope uh because jesus when he came he came for the forgiveness of all sins but every kind of sin that a person could possibly commit you know the only sin in fact 
uh, that leads to you know um, that leads to judgment is you know sins in which there is no repentance and there's no turning around and of course you know sins where people who have tasted of the holy spirit choose to go back and say you know oh, i have i've tasted of the things of god and i don't want them anymore so only in those two extreme cases you know you have uh, you know sin leading to judgment and death but here uh, this man he he believes the lie of the evil one that he is beyond hope and uh, so he goes and hangs himself so one thing very very vital to remember when you are feeling crushed by what you have done when you when you probably you know being in a, a godly person with godly values have fallen so low have fallen so horribly have you know disgraced yourself disgraced your family disgraced your church what you have done is abominable it's miserable it's terrible um at such a time you know you need to believe the truth in the word of god when it says that if you come to god god will forgive and god will purify you from your unrighteousness and god will rebuild your life you need to believe the truth more than anything at that point at that lowest point of your life where you have shamed yourself shamed the lord's name and you know you've made um, something really uh, done something terrible at that time it is important to remember that god's truth is god's truth bow to that submit to that you know grab on to it hold on to it because the truth is that jesus christ came to forgive people and give them a second chance okay a hundredth chance whatever you know he is willing to give that so rather than believing in the lie of satan and giving up hope we choose to believe what the bible says we cho choose to believe that if we go to god humbly and confess our sins he will um, forgive and he will purify us from all unrighteousness it's something that god will do for us because he has no um, interest in in destroying us he would in fact it would bring him great joy to restore even such a person and uh, bring them to a place where they have close union with god once more that would bring great joy to his heart so that is the kind of god that we serve so we should never allow sorrow and regret and remorse for our sins to make us take our eyes away from the truth of scripture which says that anyone who goes back to god will be forgiven never ever forget the truth that is there in god's word so let godly um, sorrow lead us to repentance and restoration it is worldly sorrow uh, which leads us to complete despair may we think that the only solution is you no know, killing ourselves or you know just going back into the world and just living in the world because now there is no hope god doesn't want you anymore all those are our negative evil satan ways of responding you know to the sorrow that we feel over sin so rather we should have a godly sorrow where we commit our, ourselves into the lord's hands and say yes lord i'm coming to you because i believe that you will still forgive me that you will still you know restore me um uh we have another example of um, of sorrow i am not sure to what extent this would pertain to everyone uh but i just wanted to touch upon this because there are people who kind of uh experience this you know we do something really terrible really sinful and the consequences of that are very great not only are we affected family members are affected the church is the church members who looked up to us and you know uh, trusted us they too are shaken and hurt and all of that and at that time you know there are some consequences which cannot be reversed um and at that time how do we just submit ourselves under god's hand you know uh, so i think there is some relevance and maybe we could touch upon that um so maybe we can look at second samuel chapter 12 verses 15 to 23 second samuel 12 15 to 23 if someone could uh, yeah and it's a rather large chunk maybe we can have um, okay maybe we can read out second samuel 12 um 15 to 17 yeah if 
15 to 17. If someone could read out. Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 15 to 17. Then Nathan departed to his house and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground. But he would not nor did he eat food with them. Okay, so uh, David has done something very sinful. He has confessed his sin. He reaches out to God and says, Lord, I do not want to lose your presence. Change me, help me. He's cried out for all of that. But there are consequences. And now God has stricken that little uh, you know, baby that has been born uh, with some sickness. And uh, the child is now uh, dying. And David, because he has understood the heart of God all his life and knows how merciful God is, how gracious the Lord is, even now David is hoping that maybe God will, you know, will relent and allow the child to live. And so he literally fasts like he's probably never fasted in his life. And he's, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's just you know lying there prostrate on the ground. They say, you know, at least get up and sit up. He says, no, I'm just going to keep lying over here. I want to, you know, humble myself before God and really admit that what I have done is so terrible. And if the Lord can just have mercy upon the child and, you know, uh, spare him. So uh, that is his whole um, attitude, uh, you know, in, in this situation. And uh, then, of course, on the seventh day, we get to know, you know, that the, the child dies. And it says over there in verse 18, it says, David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. Uh, because for seven days, David had probably not eaten anything, probably just, you know, just had been living on water. And maybe they, they might have given him some fruit, uh, you know, juice or something. And he's just survived in that manner. And he's in a really terrible condition. So they are scared. What will he do when he gets to know? That the child is actually dead and that God did not answer his prayer. What will his response be? And that's, you know, in fact, it's clarified over there at the end of verse 18, uh, where it says, you know, they say he may do something desperate. What if he tries to commit suicide? What if he tries to die? You know, because he's not able to bear the pain of God saying no to his prayer request. And then you know, it says in verse 19, when David sees them whispering among themselves, he realizes what has happened and he understands that the child is dead. And then we look at the response, the correct response, you know, uh, to what God has done. Verse 20, uh, what a beautiful verse. If someone could read out 2 Samuel 12, verse 20. Second Samuel 12, verse 20. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house. And when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. Okay, so here... Uh, David doesn't go into the uh, temple of the Lord wearing sackcloth, you know, in, in his um, terrible condition because for, se for seven days he's just been lying over there, uh, you know, um, in, in God's presence, hoping that God will, you know, ch you know it, that God will change something. So now when he actually goes into the temple, he um, does it in an honorable way. He cleans himself up. You know, he washes himself. He puts on lotions. You know, all the things which a which a king would you know put on. Uh, so uh, he changes his clothes, and so in in a all dressed up and looking good, he goes into God's presence to honor the Lord. And it says over there, he went into the house of the Lord and he worshipped. Okay, so he worships God. He submits to what God has done, and then he returns back home. And he gives up his his um, you know attitude of mourning, and he chooses to eat food. And the people are very surprised to say, "Why are you acting this way?" Because when the child was alive, you know you were fasting. Now here you are. You hear that the child is dead, but here you are, you know, eating and you you put on lotions and perfumes and all of that. And um, so he he just says, "You know, I did all that because I thought maybe the Lord would have mercy and save the child, but now that he is dead." No, why should I go on fasting? Um, his whole attitude is, Lord, you have your way. 
okay um so while he still had hope he did what he could from his side he really fasted he really prayed he hoped that god would spare him the consequences of the terrible sin that he had done but then once once fine god gave his final decision he so beautifully submitted to god's final decision no more sulking no more mourning of course in his heart the pain would have gone on i mean he who knows you know for months or maybe a year you know he would have continued to feel the pain in his heart but he chooses not to dwell on that he has chosen to honor god by accepting god's decision and saying okay lord let your will be done you have your way and so he doesn't allow his sorrow to turn into a worldly sorrow there is grief that he feels for his child there is pain that he is feeling that is there it's it's, it's genuine but he doesn't allow that to fester and turn into a worldly sorrow where your sorrow and pain is the only thing and you feel that god has betrayed you and that god does not care about you anymore you know it has not grown into all of those negative things because that's one thing which can happen we you know when a person sins and they have done something very terrible and the consequences are very great and you cry out to god because you know you have heard sermon after sermon about how merciful the lord is and you are hoping that god will just you know wave a magic wand and make all the bad side of it the bad uh, side effects of your sin go away and in cases where it does not happen you have to accept godly attitude and submit to him and say lord let your will be done and you need to lay aside your mourning you need to lay aside the pain that you feel and say yes it is true in my heart i'm i'll probably go on feeling pain for a while longer but i am willing to get healed i'm willing to let you work in me and start putting your joy inside me once again i'm not going to sit in the corner and go on longing for what i had before no that would be a very very wrong attitude and so here we see this man who submits himself to god he in fact honors god by wearing perfumes and going into his presence and not going over there you know in sackcloth in one desperate state but rather you know as if declaring and saying i know that i still have a future in you i still know that i have a hope in you i still know that you are for me i still believe that you will build me up so you see it's got not, none of the judas um, story over here judas just gave up complete despair and that's worldly sorrow david does not give up even though what he had longed for did not happen he continues to believe in god he continues to trust god and honors him with the right attitude and that is so important you know when it when when we are talking about repentance we choose to submit to the lord and say okay lord this is your way of dealing with what i have done with the sin that i have done so be it lord you know i choose to accept because i know that ultimately you want to build me up not crush me that is one basic truth god always he wants to build us up he never he of course wants to correct us he wants to discipline us he will in fact allow us to go through painful things so that till we learn our lesson oh yes he will do all of that but it's always with the goal of building us up never ever to destroy us or crush us and david understood this and he honored god by accepting this and you know um going to god in an honorable manner and saying yes lord i worship you because i know that you will do what is best for me he did not lose hope we are it's very very important that we must not lose hope in the lord after we have you know uh, sinned and gone away so true repentance will will continue to retain a hope in god you know um, so that which is why when when jesus comes to peter um, you know at the very end of, uh, of of the gospel of john and you know jesus says you know feed my lambs you know take care of my sheep when jesus says those things peter's not sitting over there and saying ah oh, i'm done i'm finished where on earth will you be able to use me what feeding of lambs will i do i am pathetic doesn't go on like that he says yes lord i will do it you see he totally believes that god is a god of restoration and he 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 believes that god is willing to you know uh, use him once again 
build him up once again. He approaches God so positively, believing in who God is and believing in his character. That is godly sorrow. On the other hand, if he had sat over there by the fire saying, oh, where will I ever change? How on earth will I ever, will I ever feed lambs? You know what I am. You know what I did. No, that is satanic, worldly sorrow. And Peter does not display that. So we must never, ever lose hope in our God You know when these things happen. Um, and in fact, that's what we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 to 26. OK, someone could read up 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 to 26, please. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 to 26. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So you see, genuine repentance always involves knowing the truth. Genuine repentance helps you to come to your senses, realize what was the truth, and escape from the trap of the devil. So poor Judas, you know, he believed in the lie of Satan. He was trapped by Satan, and uh, you know, he went and committed suicide. On the other hand, when you have you know, godly sorrow, which leads to genuine repentance. Genuine repentance always involves a knowledge of the truth. You understand the truth of God's word and you hold on to that and you don't allow Satan to trap you. OK, so um, we choose to think. OK, so we, when we sinned, we fell away. OK, we, 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 we fell away. We betrayed God trust. We did all of that. But now we get back on our feet and we say, uh, I will now come back to the scriptures and hold on to the scriptures. I will align my mind with what the scripture says. Rather than thinking what Satan is saying, I choose to align my mind with the word of God because the word of God is truth. And rather than believing falsehood, I choose to believe what the truth of God's word says. So an important aspect of repentance is uh, we choose to start realigning ourselves even after having fallen away now we have you know uh, repented we have asked the lord for forgiveness he has forgiven and now we get back to realigning ourselves once more with god's word thinking the way god wants us to think thinking in line with scripture okay and so so um this is a very important aspect of repentance where we choose to believe in the word of God and the truth of God's word rather than in the lies that have been that are being told to us. Um, so uh, maybe another one aspect of repentance that we can talk about is um, I think maybe one of the most important things that we can talk about repentance is uh, about doing it quickly. The quicker you are. The, the more quickly you come back to the Lord and submit, the safer you and I would be. You know, so the more we delay, the more we hesitate to come back to God, the more we think, ah, okay, maybe I'll sin for a few more days and then I will go back to God. Or if we say, my goodness, after the terrible thing that I have done, how do I show my face to the Lord? What words do I use? How can I even go approach him after what I did? So whether it is you know the that that love for sin which is causing us to delay, or whether it is this deep um, uh, sense of uh, shame that is making us delay, it is dangerous to delay. The faster you can come back to the Lord, the more quickly you are now under the shelter of His wings, and there He will protect you. There He will rebuild you. The longer you are out there greater the chances that Satan will meddle with your mind and you know cause all kinds of wrong attitudes to come into your heart. And then you'll find it more difficult to come back to God. So um, quick responses, I think, are like really vital, really important. 
um so this this um, passage you know which kind of um, um talks about that matthew chapter 13 verses 10 to 17 which is like a large chunk um maybe we can just quickly you know go through it uh, matthew 13 verses 10 to 17 okay so the disciples basically come to jesus and they say why do you okay the, i mean uh, the reason that we are kind of covering this particular passage is because it's there in your um notes and also there's some very important learning regarding repentance that you know that can come out of this so which is why we are kind of you know uh, taking the time to dwell upon this i think we will not really be able to finish our repentance teaching today itself it's all right you know whatever is left over we'll you know cover it in the next class um and then we will get into the you know overcoming life uh, but i think these are um basic important things that we need to reflect upon uh, because these these all are uh, very practical in nature so you know let's let's do this i mean uh, let's let's do it how much over time it may take uh, so matthew 13 10 to 17 the disciples come to jesus and they ask why do you speak to the people in parables because you know it's little um, uh, the the myth that we have today is that jesus used parables to make the make it very very simple for the people to understand but that's not the fact right i mean if you look in um, the gospels you realize that whenever jesus spoke in parables the people didn't quite catch what jesus was saying only some people the ones who genuinely were open in their hearts the holy spirit would reveal the truth to them okay or if they have not caught it directly from the holy spirit jesus christ you know would arrange uh, to either explain directly to them or you know one of his disciples would later go to the people and explain the 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 essence of what he had actually been saying so in fact jesus used parables to hide uh, uh, valuable truths uh, from all the people who are just there for the fun of it you know they they are there for the drama to watch uh, the miracles and watch the fun that's going on they're not really serious about the things of god and jesus regards the truths that he is you know speaking as valuable pearls he's not going to throw his pearls in front of pigs because because what do the pigs do the pigs will just trample it because they don't even realize the value of what they are trampling so uh, jesus is very very careful that he reveals his pearls to only those who are willing to catch it who are willing to appreciate its value and um, so jesus says the reason i speak in parables and the reason i don't speak openly is because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given only to certain people you know he later on goes on to clarify what he means by that you know he says those uh, he says in verse 12 matthew 13 verse 12 whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them and then um, he goes on to say you know um, uh, this is what was actually explained even in the old testament he says so he talks about in verse 15 he says this people's heart has become calloused they hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes otherwise they might see with their eyes hear with their ears understand with their hearts and turn and i would heal them but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear so the people have chosen to close their eyes they have chosen to close their ears they don't really want to know the truth they just want to watch the fun of the miracles and the drama of it all and you know to go back home and say you know this is what i saw they're not really interested in 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 repenting they are not interested in changing their ways they are not interested in submitting to what god is saying and you know um, genuinely turning away from their sinful ways they are not interested in those things their hearts have become calloused they have become hard hearted um, because if they genuinely wanted to understand uh, you know jesus says uh, such people you know they would turn around and i would heal them but those people they don't have that attitude uh, but, but on the other hand he says to his disciples in you know matthew 13 16 he says blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear and then he goes on to say in verse 17 truly i tell you 
many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it so jesus is saying you know what i'm giving to you are valuable pearls very very precious the prophets in the old testament and the righteous people who lived back then were longing for such things but they didn't receive it you guys are being given that uh, so a very very great privilege is being bestowed upon them and so he says it's specifically to you people that i'm revealing these things because you are open to receive what i am saying you you eager to act upon what i am teaching you it's like you know you're hungry and the minute i say something you it's like you're willing to grab it accept it act upon it and start implementing it in your life so when jesus sees that eagerness in a person it makes him want to give more and more to that person on the other hand if we have this casual attitude and say yeah i know it was such a lovely message that i heard over there in the church and yeah my heart felt touched but yeah when i have the time permits i'll get around to it i know i'm supposed to make some changes yeah when i have the time i'll do that you're not valuing what is being given to you and it says over here whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them very very serious words spoken by jesus directly you know and uh, so in that same uh, you know following that same vein he touches upon this topic again in mark chapter 4 verse 24 to 25 and there actually is the crux of you know this uh, what i'm trying to lead up to um mark chapter 4 verses 24 and 25 if someone could read out Mark four twenty four and twenty five. Mark chapter four verse twenty four to twenty five. Then he said to them, "Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him." Um. Yeah. Not sure of the translation that. you read out from but i'm okay maybe it brings out that sense in another way but this is what you know jesus says uh, in you know uh, in the nkjv in the niv and in many of the other versions um it says consider carefully what you hear with the measure you use it will be measured to you and even more beyond the measure that you used you know so with the measure you use it will be measured to you and even more so whoever has will be given more whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them so what is the measure that you use um in accepting and acting upon god's word when god reveals something to you you know now this actually applies both to the promises of god and to the correction of god all right uh, so um what is our response to the promises of god and to the correction of god so if if the lord is speaking some word of correction what is the measure that i use in the way i respond to it so if my measure the measure which i am using is indifference okay so i uh, when god corrects me regarding something you know something pricks my heart during my quiet time when i'm spending time in his presence god says something and i'm like kind of indifferent i think yeah i know it's true what god is saying is correct i need to deal with that area of my life yeah i'll get around to it when i get around to it so you, you the measure that you're using is indifference this is what god says with the measure you use it will be measured to you and even more so if you are indifferent about the things that i am revealing to you i too will be indifferent in reve- in revealing more things to you in fact i will add to your measure i will be even extra you know indifferent i'll be even more indifferent i'll be um, more indifferent than you are and i will stop revealing things to you so it's kind of um, very dangerous uh, because what he is offering us is something that the prophets longed for something that the righteous people longed for in the old testament and they did not get it that is just being given to us so freely so generously so people who don't value it they are in danger of losing even what they have okay so this is something that we should take very seriously with regard to god's promises 
and to his words of correction so when the lord corrects if we are like you know like the disciples who were eager to change themselves who were eager to respond and act upon what god is saying such people he uses the you know the measure that they are using is one of eagerness they really want to accept what is being told and they want to act upon what they are being told so in the case of such people jesus uses their measure because they are eager he is also eager to uh, to reveal more and more to them and it, it's not just that uh, you know his um, is eager he says and even more which means he will take an additional 10 steps to reveal to them more than they even expected so uh, whatever measure you're using that is the measure that god will use with you and he'll in fact add to that measure so it is dangerous to have an attitude of indifference when god gives us a word of correction it is also very very dangerous to ignore you know uh, when god gives a word of promise and we're like yeah i know it's nice promise but it sounds a little too elaborate to believe should i believe it now if you have that kind of an attitude then it's kind of dangerous because the lord says consider carefully how you know what you hear how you hear will determine uh, the future revelations that god will continue to give uh, so god appreciates repentance that is done quickly eagerly with a longing to respond to what god is saying on the other hand if we have a very casual attitude god will also use the same measure he will be casual in his future revelations to us so uh, because these are not potatoes and tomatoes that is you know uh, dealing out to us these are the very words of a divine god containing divine power in them so if we can catch hold of these scriptures and be eager to you know accept them and act upon them you know it can you know change and transform our lives gosh this noise level is really bad over here i'm just so glad that our class is almost done um yeah all right um okay we will we, there are just a few more things that we need to deal with you know with regard to repentance so we will cover those things in the next class um but um maybe for the midterm exam we will only have um, the portion which has been covered up to you know now so if you were to in fact think about your notes you know the textbook given to you that would be up to chapter 8 of repentance all right so for your midterm exam uh, you will have up to chapter 8 of repentance right from the first beginning right from the section on holiness from the first chapter there up to um the repentance section chapter 8 of cha of uh, the repentance section so you for your midterm uh, that would be the portion and um, yeah all the very best to know even as you work on that uh, so let's just close with a word of prayer for now um yeah Lord we just thank you so much for today's class thank you lord for the practical learnings that we could reflect upon uh, regarding uh, this whole subject of repentance lord give us hearts that are eager to know your word that are very very eager to respond to you and lord i pray that because we have that kind of an eagerness in us uh, that would um, you know make you want to give us even more so that we can walk deeper and deeper into who you are and become more and more like you so that we will literally reflect your holiness lord in 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 the way we speak in in, in the choices that we make uh, in our very mind which is getting renewed day by day i pray oh lord that you would do all of this for us so we just commit ourselves into your hands and also lord bless the students and be with them even as they work on the midterm assessment thank you lord in jesus name Amen. Amen. Thank you so much and uh, yeah, we'll meet again next class. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ma